So usually how I, I like to start these conversations is, is about an individual's journey and their path to kind of get uh, where they are. And, and usually when I, when I chat with individuals, they're doing something, they're at that like, sort of life's work stage. You know, they're really, they're really building something that they'll dedicate years of their life to, if not decades, right? So just tell us a little bit about your amazing journey so far before you started AP Investments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grant. I'm so excited to, uh, to be here and to talk about that. So I'm Kenyan, so born and raised in Kenya. And then I got this amazing luck of winning a lottery. I like to call the fact that I got a scholarship. Go to a fifth and sixth form school, which then led further scholarship to Cornell in the US. So the journey from Western Kenya to where I am today is via a series of highly unlikely events. Um, and that is really number one in the reason why HB is so important to me uh, is because I do want to remove that uh, degree of uncertainty about uh, how people with potential uh, are linked with opportunity. Uh, leaving it all to luck does not, uh, is not a sound strategy. That luck led to Cornell. After that, I worked in a number of global justice organizations. I worked at the UN Population Fund, the World Health Organization. Um, I then went on to Oxford to do advanced for my advanced degrees. And then after that, I came back to the UN again, um, worked on a range of uh, global justice issues. But one of the things that was clear to me in my both my experience earlier in Cornell, but also in Oxford, is how finance was a big barrier to more Africans participating in that education. Um, and so, you know, in addition to wanting to remove luck as a key element, uh, right. it was very evident that there were students who were dropping out, students who were starting journeys they couldn't complete um, because of financing. Then the, 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 the third and perhaps most recent uh, reason why the journey then took the turn that it did is that as I worked in the international space grant, um, grant I was just about to call you Graham, mixing your two, you know, your first and last name. Sure, sure. <laughs> I was uh, working in that space, what became really apparent is that I was often the one African, the only African, the first African in many rooms. And that was not only in my work in the international space, but when I interacted with colleagues in the uh, for-profit sector, the corporate sector, there were a range of places, there just weren't enough Africans in decision making, particularly when a lot of that decision making had to do with what goes on on the African continent. So those are some of the factors that led me to a point of saying, what is the thing I want to be caught solving? And you know, where are the places I can 10x my impact? And it really seemed to me it's in the place of matching talent with opportunity and particularly providing financing for African students to enter those talent pipelines from which they can then become ecosystem builders and decision makers globally. And that is what led me to then, you know, leave the diplomatic space where I had spent many years and enter the entrepreneurial space. And that's where I am now. Amazing. So I wanted to go back to one, one quick question. You spoke about the lottery. When I graduated my Kenyan high school, one of my friends got a scholarship to go to fifth and sixth form at the United World Colleges in the UK. Mm -hmm. I knew that had happened, but I did not know anything other than she had gone to this school. One day, I met her sister. Her sister, I knew her because I, you know, I had encountered her socially and I spoke to her sister and I uh, said, hey, how are you doing? And she said, oh, you know, uh, we've just visited my sister in the UK and here is a picture of her in a double-decker bus in London. And Grant, I looked at that picture and I thought, I want to be in a double-decker bus in London. <laughs> How does one end up in a school that includes being in a double-decker bus in London? And that sort of parked the idea of this abstract notion of, you know, this friend being in London made it real because I had seen the picture of it. And then this really should underscore the lotteriness of this. I went to visit a friend whose parents used to have a daily newspaper. My family did not buy a daily newspaper. And I looked at the classified section back okay. in the day when, you know, newspapers had classified sections. And there was an ad for applying to this school for huh. the scholarship 
what are the chances that I would meet a sister of a friend who makes the issue real? I run into a newspaper ad in a friend's living room, and then it occurs to me that this is that, and I link them together and I make the application. So that wow. is some of the chance that I'm talking about. Wow. And then you move on from that. There is hundreds and hundreds of incredibly smart 16, 17, 18 year olds who are making the application at the same time as I am, because basically they said, you know, if you had a grade a point, this a uh, grade point average above this, and you had right. chip, um, a background and you have this and that, and that is hundreds, hundreds of kids. Um, and that leads to a shortlisting of perhaps fewer students and then an actual offer to me to be one of the four kids that year that got that mm. Wow. Really outstanding. So the, the sequence of events that leads to that is what I call lottery. There yeah. ought to be a process by which if you're smart and you have ambition, you can go somewhere, find the information about where you can apply to school, find money if you do not get a scholarship that enables you to take advantage of that opportunity. Living it to the series of yeah. 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 events that I had the fortune to have happened to me is not a sound strategy for building human capital for the African continent. That's what I meant by that. And every year, Grant, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of African students have exactly that you know, same process of either trying to win the lottery and not winning it, uh, right. or one of the lucky ones that uh, is able to get that sequence of events right. So this is a good segue into what 8B is, is sort of all about, uh, I guess, right? And what you're trying to build and what, what your the holes and the gaps that you're trying to fill. So give us a little bit of, of the overall mission of, of 8B and I guess what was sort of the key, was the key the funding aspect or was it just the ease of like application process too? Like you said, now we're not gonna find it in the back of a classified ads in a newspaper, right? I'm sure the process is a bit different now and and probably better, right? Where you have access to apply to probably more schools, right, than ever before, but maybe not, right? So, so give you give you an idea of what I guess the process is like now and, and what AB's mission is. The process remains complicated because of information asymmetry. Uh, but even if one had information and one managed to apply and one managed to get an offer, the biggest barrier is financing. So then, to take a step back. What HB is foundationally transforming is the funding landscape because that is the biggest barrier. So we're building a fintech company that is specializing in lending to African students going to global universities. But funding assumes the student has already found the school and applied and got the offer. And now what is remaining is just funding. And gotcha. while there is, you know, a financing gap of about $25 billion for students who meet exactly that criteria, they have found the school, applied, received the offer, now they're stuck at the financing. There is many, many orders of magnitude, more students who are stuck in the process somewhere because to be able to know where to apply in a world of you know, thousands of potential universities, right. um, you know, how do you uh, sift through that information, right? So uh, curating that information is part of the constellation of services that we're offering to African students. And once you're here and you're uh, you know, uh, the, the only or one of a handful of students in lonely Ithaca in Cornell, you know, just right, right. <laughs> Um, how do you build a sense of community, get shoulders to step on and move up on your pathway to success? So that is work around mentorship and community building, which we're also doing for African students in global universities. The overall vision grant is how do we equip a critical mass of African leaders and ecosystem builders with the tools they need to compete innovate and thrive in a knowledge economy of the 21st century. And that is a very different proposition than what is typical when people are thinking about African development. You would be familiar with the you know, charity fundraising approach, which child who is malnourished and you know, $100. Right, right. We've been very conditioned in the global north that $100 dollars, a thousand dollars, you know, provide a, a basket weaver with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you know, with a, a small loan to start a basket weaving um, business, yep. you know, um, that, that is how we think about what 
um, African needs to move out of poverty. But that's a, that's a notion that is incomplete. I think it ought to be and absolutely must be complemented by an approach that thinks about the bigger picture. And what that looks like is in addition to the $100 or $1,000 for the basket weaver, there ought to be a $50,000 loan to the woman from um, that part of the world who goes to NYU business school and will eventually build a woven basket industry that creates a supply chain of those basket weavers into Target, right? How do we get there? Because that is how you expand the pie and end poverty. Otherwise, we are all sort of you know, operating within the same fixed pie. And yes, there is more economic activity, but the pool of resources from which it is, the, tr the pool of resources is not growing. And we don't get to transformation by, by operating with that poverty mindset. I am really keen that there be a new generation and in larger numbers than we have seen before. And we can, seeing that we are the youngest continent in the world, we'll have the world's largest workforce by 2035 there is a critical there, there is a population to draw from um, of people who will be those ecosystem builders people who will make africa as a continent be what china has been in the last two three decades for the world the place where world-class products can be produced and and serve global marketplaces and so on so I'm, I'm sort of you know that vision doesn't happen when all we think about is can i make a donation and feel good about that and consider the problem solved for africa to be an equal we need to be playing a completely different game and part of that game is human capital and that is the lane to which we are making a contribution at aid there's two things right? i guess one would be is are you going directly to the schools, right, in Africa and saying this is available to the students of Africa? Let's start with that first, is, is, is how, I guess, how are we onboarding students to, to even know about, know that this is available? So, yeah, that's a great question. The, 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 the reality, Grant, is that there are very, very few places where students can get financing for a global education, even for a domestic education. 100%, like, right, 100%, yes. It's such a constrained space that today an entrepreneur in Mombasa, Kenya will get a loan that is secured with assets at 23%. So it's impossible, it's prohibitive. You cannot borrow for school, much less borrow for the usual productive activities that, eco you know, that, that economies require. So that means that everybody who has ambition is already looking. So where do they look? The first place they look is the usual providers of scholarships. And you have places like MasterCard Foundation who are doing a great job at um, giving scholarships to Africans going to a wide variety of universities. That mm -hmm. is a limited pool of money. Previously, right. Ford Foundation had a big grant. It was called the International Fellowship program and it was you know roughly 450 million dollars that was spent over a decade for grad students um, going globally uh, for 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 school including african students and and that also came to an end but it was you know at a four percent um acceptance rate right it was very very competitive and i think most of the time when we look at this very scarce sources of financing we want to celebrate the fact that there was a 4% acceptance rate, meaning, oh, we're very selective, but we also ought to feel heartbroken about the 96 uh, out of every 100 students. Chances are for them to get to that final stage, they were fantastic. And the limiting factor wasn't their brilliance. It was the pool of money that was available, right? So that is the starting point. Demand is out there. Demand is currently unmet. And my own experience of applying to grad school was uh, applying a number of years. Um, and I was mostly applying to the same place. I was applying to Oxford and the LSC, the places I wanted to go to, until finally some money came through. And I was like, oh, there, I got some money. I can go now. And even then, my first year was fully funded. And then my following years were not funded. And I was back to that square one of looking for financing. So there is a natural pipeline there of there is ambitious students who are, you know, constantly just, you know, shaking the tree to see if anything falls. And what they're looking for is where is the additional tree that I can be shaking? So we enter that space because we 
are in a range of networks where the kinds of students who are looking for uh, opportunities abroad will be able to find us. The other thing that I will add here is that we are also partnering Sorry, let me pause. So that is a direct to student modality of customer acquisition, if you will. You know, students will know about us. And I wanted to give an example there. When we launched our pilot um, uh, in, in, in uh, mid to late 2018, uh, we basically, you know, reached out to mostly my personal network and said, hey, guys, we're starting this little pilot. You know, if you know a handful of African students who have offers from global universities and are looking for financing, please have them, you know, send this for five pieces of information and then we can you know put them in, in in the process and grant within a five-day period we had approximately 1500 students applying who if you approximate that they need roughly 20,000 apiece that's you know about 30 million dollars worth of demand that is just me reaching out to my network right. telling people hey we're piloting this thing people have offers this is a multi-generational problem my father had the same problem i've had the problem my siblings I, you know there is no african who has had a global education that's i shouldn't say there is no there are very few africans who have had a global education who will not have a story of the battlefield of of trying to get financing so that's the direct to student modality the second modality which we're really excited about and we have signed on one school in this regard is where we partner with a university in the global north. So we have a university partner here in the US. And what that is, is the students have already applied and have received offers from the university. When they meet the geographical requirement, which we fund, the university basically sends them to us. And the additional thing that I'm excited about in this modality, because I you know, come from a background of working, uh, uh, including in development finance, and so the idea of bringing some of those tools into this space in order to attract more private capital is, is, is something that I'm, I'm really keen to do. So what I'm excited about with this university is that they're also willing to create a risk reserve for the students at their university. What does that mean? That means for every $100 we lend to their students, we will remit somewhere between, let's say roughly, we will remit roughly $80 to the university and we will put $20 to the side in a pool that is risk pool. So if the students should default, the university will be out $20. Um, if the students finish repaying, the money in that pool goes back to the university. So the university is risk sharing. They're having some skin in the game uh, in, in, in this modality. So we're really excited about replicating that. But had that hopefully answers your question of how are the students knowing about us. Wow. With the networks um, where yep. students will be about us, they are plentiful of them. So they're out there and we're working with universities. The one thing I would say is, it, and look, I think we can, everybody has their own sort of, I think, opinion about this, but the fact that a college education even costs this much, I think is a problem, right? And I think that trying to figure out a way where it's not even like, we're, we're talking about accessibility, right? And, and, and scholarships, but like you said, it's not even that easy for a, a, a student in the United States to go to a college, right? Because that like we had, we need the same loans as, as a person from Africa, right? Or a person from Yugoslavia, right? Or a person from Russia, whatever global student, right? Like we face similar problems because the cost of education is frankly outrageous in a lot of ways, right? I agree with you that the, the cost has been outrageous in the US, but um, I think uh, there are, there, there, are two, there are two problems here. There is the problem of are there quality universities that students globally want to come to? The answer is yes. Um, uh, do those, are those universities currently affordable? And even if uh, the, the price was to be slashed by a third, um, uh, you know, or, 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 or even, you know, we only were paying a quarter of it, it would still be inaccessible uh, for most um, African students who are making applications to it. And, and by the way, one thing that you may or may not know, Grant, is that in many universities, international students are charged two to three times what domestic students are charged. So domestic students gotcha. are enraged about the cost. <laughs> like, 
what, you know, this is what it costs. That, that's wow. just what it is. And then, you know, and the challenge um, in the US, um, it, it, the US is obviously an extreme version of this, but, uh, you know, the UK where there's a lot more central control over what the pricing looks like. This is like mm -hmm. Canada that have not had the same inflationary forces in the, in the higher education space. They're, they're, st they're very attractive for African students. And they're still very expensive, right? So in the end, the, uh, the, the way we are, we, are, we are entering this space is we're requiring that the university have some skin in the game. And that is uh, first in the form of partial funding to a student. There is no way in which our students are paying a full ticket price. And then the second is this additional mechanism of having some reserve funding for risk when we lend to those students. And universities are interested in this grant because they're looking to diversify their student uh, Right. Uh, sources, right? You know, in a context where 60% of students in the US are in China um, and geopolitics has gotten us where we are, you can see universities really struggling, particularly yep. in the STEM areas, to keep their course offerings going without a diversification of some of those international student sources. So student universities are willing to forego some income or some of the cost that they charge in order to have more students uh, in those classrooms. So uh, that's, that's part of what we are, we are banking on. But I completely agree with you. Some of these costs are, are outrageous. The, the silver lining, uh, Grant, is that um, COVID has forced a reckoning around this because the question um, is early in COVID, I think it was around April, I was giving a, a, a seminar to an MBA, uh, a group of MBAs in a, a, a very a selective university and they're paying over a hundred thousand dollars for the MBA and they had just gone online and the class was on zoom and you know as part of the uh it was a sustainable finance uh seminar as part of the discussion with the students I had a poll where I asked them you know what they were willing to pay if the classes continued to be exclusively on zoom and about 80 percent um said they would pay half or less of what they were currently right. Being charged, right? Right. Uh, what universities have to live with that sentiment from students and parents. And so that can only put downward pressure on the cost because it had just become runaway pricing and this this arms race of the best gym and the best you know, food in the cafeteria and the rest of it, which when people are back in their living rooms and still being charged $50,000 um, a year, is just not sustainable. Uh, so the, the, there is um, the end uh, is coming of the you know permanently increasing uh, cost of, of higher ed, and yep. I think what that's going to do is for those of us who believe that higher ed is is valuable, I think we will see more and more um, students feel that they're not priced out and therefore they will want to partake in some of this premium higher education. And I think that's a good thing. I wanna go back to that 4% that, that you said earlier. And, and it's like, you know, we got 96% that is, you know, left behind is a bad word, but just at this point in time, they, 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 they're not accepted, right? And I, I wanted to, to get your thoughts on it. I, I understand the allure of, you know, these global universities, right, that, that have this sort of, these sort of landmark reputations and, and do all these really good things. You know, as expensive as it is, look, you, a lot of amazing people come out of these institutions, right, and they do uh, a good job in a lot of ways. But I, I think for those 96%, right, if, we're, if, if the idea is to just, if the idea is to skill people, right, and to, to give them talent, a traditional university is not maybe always the right way to go, right? Maybe these 96% of students who applied didn't get to that 4% and got the scholarship. Why can't we team up with these coding boot camps, right? There are hundreds now, hundreds now that for $10,000, $12,000, you know, a person can get trained JavaScript developer and make 60K a year, right? Wherever they are in the world looking for a company in tech, right? So I think there's these other avenues where, okay, maybe you didn't get the NYU business school, right? But like, that's not maybe for everybody, right? But like, there's, if the idea is to skill, you know, millions of people, like that part probably is not going to be scalable for that, right? Yeah. But these boot camps can enable those other 96% an opportunity, right, to change our lives as well. Yeah. So I think your, um, the, the question 
is, is a really important one. And the question is saying, what is the mix of tools that we need in order to create economies and workforces that can compete and thrive, right, in the knowledge economy? And I, I do agree that there is a lane there for the apprenticeship model, for the credentialing model, for the, you know, you need this skill right now because AI is a thing and we need people who are going to be able to do the labeling of some of this data and, you know, they will be earning more than they right. would if they were waving baskets. So I get all that, but I see this as part of a symphony of solutions. I don't think that going down just that pathway is the way you get to globally competitive economies. I reject the idea that Africa should just be the equivalent of the 21st century sweatshop for data, for global data, right? We need to have our own innovators who are part of, of course. The, finding yeah. the 21st century. And that kind of means, you know, they might end up, uh, you know, being in, in Silicon Valley for a while. They might, end, they're just part of that mix. Nobody looks at uh, Sundar Pichai at Google and says, oh, he should be back in India, solving India's problems. You know, we are, re India is, is doing marvelously, uh, both in the global imagination and in real ways in the tech sector because people like him, you know, head the kinds of global companies that they do. Um, That's what- Of course, doing. of course, but there, of course, totally. But there's still going to be, you know, a billion people, you know, 700, 800 million people living below the poverty line in India, right? So how do we get that, right? Because everybody's not going to be able to be him, right? And be like CEO of Google, right? You know, that's just not, that's impossible, right? So I, I always look at those other massive amount of people, right, who live on, that are, that are going to be kind of stuck in, in poverty for a, for a very long time, unless they are, are, are skilled in, in something, right? That he'd be able to bring right. something to the table. That's, from a skill point of view. I agree with that. And right now, we think about that as let's have bottom of the pyramid development interventions and move people from a dollar a day to two dollars a mm -hmm, day. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is we need both and. We need to be doing that, but we need to also be creating the people. Yep. The leaders, the leaders. Yep. The big yep. systems that end poverty. You don't end poverty yep. by moving people from a dollar to two dollars. You right. end by creating you know pathways to the global consuming class you and you know there's a there's a bigger story there and that story the solutions to it are in people's brilliant in people's heads and those people are the people we need to identify find mm -hmm. a way of of investing in lots and lots of them and getting a thousand flowers blooming <laughs> i i love the the idea that you did take a a non-profit approach i i do truly believe that business and business models are the way we solve a lot of our issues. And I think, you know, up to this point, we just haven't, we haven't had that sweet symphony of, of sort of business to solve problems. We have used business to, you know, exploit labor and create maybe more problems, right? But I think the power of business is so powerful that it can solve a lot of these issues. So do you want to talk a little bit about the business model of 8B? And you're also using another mechanism that I like. ISA. Yeah, the ISA loans. Yeah, 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 the ISA loans. So can you, I guess, share a little bit about why you chose to be a company, right, rather than a nonprofit, and then why, why ISAs you think have a really great opportunity to change the course of how we pay for education? So those are great questions. Let me start with the ISA one because it's quicker to dispense with, and then we can move to the, to the business model. Sure. What we want is flexibility um, and the ability to enable people to do what they're best suited to do um, and to enable people to go geographically where they want to go, to be able to, you know, stop working at McKinsey and go off to Monrovia for a year or two in the health ministry and then come back to BCG or whatever they want to be doing. We want to be able to follow uh, this community of uh, African ecosystem builders and be supportive of the pathways they're taking. And then it just makes, it follows from that principle that we would want to have an instrument of financing that has that flexibility 
baked into it. And that's what the, the income contingent model of which the ISA is one variety, but that is what that does. There are many challenges with that way of thinking. Um, there are lots of resistance to it. Um, but in the end, I think it comes down to, you know, if I were to, if the option was for me to drop out of school or to get um, uh, uh, this form of financing to invest in my education, which I know would allow me to get that higher um, earning uh, capacity, would I take it? And, and we have to respect uh, people's choice choices on this and, and they would take it. So, um, you know, lots are being written about in the ISA space, uh, lots of experimentation there. It's a very exciting space. Latin America has been, has been ahead of the curve for some time. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation about regulatory wise, what needs to happen. So on our part, we are working with back office providers who are best in class in this space. And so we, we feel excited about, you know, the direction that that is going. So flexibility is really the core point and because we want to build a community where we want to know where people have gone people need to be reporting on you know income and where they are is it time to pose the clock because they're backpacking all that um is 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 uh facilitated through the isa model but to your first question which is why a business and not um a not-for-profit i have to say grant i wish i could say i was wiser but i i i i landed on that out of um adversity right i think when i <laughs> the UN, my initial thinking was, you know, here we go, we can create a mega for student financing, mega being the multilateral mm -hmm. bank. I you know, knew very well how that worked. And if we do that, we can unlock funding and people, you know, students will go to school and we will be, you know, happy. And then I wandered through the desert of, uh, you know, philanthropy and uh, the, the wilderness of NGOs and just that universe to see what innovative partnerships we could come up with to make this work in the not-for-profit sector. And I have to say, it was disappointing. And that's in part because of the silos within which the uh, not-for-profit world works. So to be able to do something like this in the not-for-profit way, you need to be able to have uh, partners and program officers in the foundation who get it, right? So mm -hmm. I'll give an example of what some of those limitations are. And I, I just recently did a piece for Stanford Social Innovation Review, capturing some of my experience in a hypothetical, you know, case study, just to illustrate the challenges that philanthropy has in uh, funding innovation. So what happens when you have a solution like ours, and you're trying to fund it exclusively in the not-for-profit space is that the first place you will be sent to is the education program officer. And the education program officer is going to have grants with which to provide scholarships. Um, and that's about the only instrument in their toolbox. And chances are they are not, except for very, very few foundations, they are not doing higher education because a lot of the education program officers are focusing where the need is greatest. And that is in, you know, a lower, right, K to 12 space. Um, in, in, you know, making sure, I said, I, I talked about a symphony of solutions earlier. Um, higher education is really at the higher end of this story. There's a lot more need in the basic education. And if you were to have competing causes for a bunch of money and one is kids who need to learn how to write or Lydia who needs to go to Cornell, you would fund the kids who need to go to write because there's lots of them and the transformation is big. So philanthropy and in the way it is in the program officer, the education program officer, it's just not gonna work for us. So they will say goodbye, you're doing great, good luck. Um, if you go to thematic program officers, right? You know, say you want to uh, focus on the health workforce or the climate change workforce, right? We're gonna be financing geoengineers and solid state physicists uh, going to do advanced degrees because they will solve climate change and health. And you go to the program officers who think about these things. They also have grant, resources they don't think about the other asset base of the foundation and critically grant they don't think about human capital they finance meetings and gadgets but not people who will mm. call those gadgets right. so right. will fall through the cracks if you go to the people who in the foundation are typically thinking about the in you know the non-grant side of the foundation where they can put money as um, in a subordinated 
position in a capital tranche. Uh, they're used to this uh, instruments and the structures we propose, but they don't know the use case for education, right? They know how to do this for low income housing. They know how to do this for other areas, but they have not used this for education. And our innovation is not that we are bringing rocket science. Our innovation is that we're taking instruments that have been used in agriculture and low income housing and other spaces and saying this can remove risk in the higher education space and allow scale for, uh, ed for higher education for Africans. But that lack of flexibility within the various officers in the foundation, if you will, will let them, will have them say, yeah, really interesting, but we don't have, uh, we don't have that use case. So we're not your guy, right? Or your, or, or your, or your lady. So that, that's going to, that's the pathway that then led us to realize that the, our natural allies, how we were going to get this done was not going to be through the not-for-profit space. And so we then proceeded and raised um, as a, as a, a corporation and uh, incorporated in Delaware and uh, became a company and here we are. Love it. No, I think, it's, uh, I think there needs to be immense innovation within NGOs and, and nonprofits. So uh, I'm glad that you, you kind of just decided to go this route, you know, because I think you would just be, you know, you're just, you're just so hamstrung and you just, there's so much red tape and there's not much room to innovate, right? And, and, and sort of, you know, do things rapidly to, to change stuff. I think that is partly true, but also it's partly because the kind of problem we're solving grant is actually best solved through a market-based solution. Yep, yep. There is a case to be made about primary and secondary education serving social good more than right. good. When it comes to university education, it is widely accepted that I am as, 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 as a primary a beneficiary as society is. Yes, society does better by having a highly skilled workforce, but I am the key beneficiary mm -hmm. of my higher income. And so privatizing the provision of higher education in some disciplines, and some disciplines you can argue that it ought to be uh, supported by the state. Um, I think mm. I, I, that is a case that is a, a lot less disputed. So in a world of scarce philanthropic resources, we want philanthropic resources to be leveraged. We, you know, the idea that there is a, 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 a universe in which if there's a dollar in, dollar out for higher education globally, feels um, unoptimized. And I think what we want is for philanthropic and other kinds of capital to be loss mitigators. They cannot be what takes us to scale. What they can do is stand in a position that enables return seeking capital to step into a space they couldn't, it couldn't otherwise step into. So that's, that's really the innovation that we're bringing here. And we're really excited about that. But I'll say one more thing about the uh, lack of innovation in, in the philanthropic sector. Um, I think many NGOs find themselves in this situation, um, Grant, where they have to work with foundations who have all those silos that I have described. Right, but right. foundations also have ways of working that uh, frankly need to be, we need to be critical of. Um, I think one of the things that I find really interesting is that foundations are less risk taking than they mm. are. The reason why foundation exists in the space they do where we all subsidize them through that uh, tax break that they yep. get. Yep. They ought to be underwriting the, the, the social risk taking, right? Governments yep. struggle because they have their electoral cycle, cycle, companies have to do their reporting. Philanthropy is the space where, you know, they should be writing the first check and yes. you know, making everybody unsolicited who has the best possible thoughts to be implementing those thoughts in service of solving our collective problems. Instead, we find a lot of herding, a lot of, you know, who mm -hmm. else has written your check, a lot of, you know, this is too new for us. And yet that really is, is one of the places where they add the highest value. There was a, there's a book um, uh, I've recently finished trading, um, Rob Reich, Just Giving. And in his view, there, there's only two things um, uh, that justify having, uh, protecting philanthropy in a democracy. Uh, one of them is it, it encourages uh, plurality of ideas, but the other is that it underwrites this social risk taking. And when, when yeah. we fail to, when philanthropy fails to do that, um, it, it fails. Um, and so I feel like there is a bigger question here that is less about the lack of innovation in NGOs and more about what role is philanthropy, philanthropy playing in society. But that's a topic for another day. <laughs> but it's, it's so well said, and I wish we, I wish we had 
you know, an hour to talk about talk about that because I do think it's such an important it's a it's an immensely important important topic. I, I usually like to end on the future a little bit. Obviously, right now it, the future is a little different than it would be, you know, 12 months ago, right? But I think it could be different in a very optimistic way, right? Like you said, I mean, you're playing in the space that is changing very, very rapidly, right? Where we're paying $100,000 for an MBA is, you know, probably not going to happen anymore when your classes are through Zoom. So what is, I guess from the 8B perspective, what is the next, you know, five years look like for you? And what are some of the goals and successes that you want to accomplish? What we're excited about is the fact that increasingly, uh, and particularly because of this crisis, the global interdependence has become so much more uh, clear. Not like it wasn't before, but people are now more likely to believe that an episode in a meat market in Wuhan would have real consequences on a, a Fortune 500 CEO in New York than they right. would in, you know, 12 months ago, right? right. In the realm of fiction. What that means is that there's greater awareness that problems are global and greater awareness that we ought to be bringing our, the full force of human capacity to solve those problems. The fact that Africa remains this massively undertapped repository of potential is a loss to everyone. So the dawning of uh, the dawning to the world that we need the, you know, the full potential of all of us is something that I'm encouraged by and that I think is going to bring more and more um, of the, the, the statement uh, African talent is going to be more common uh, going forward than it has been in the past. And really that's, that's where we, we want to go, where it is not unusual. You know, one is not the only African, the, the, the first African in, in a space and in a context as well, grant where questions around diversity in global talent pools, uh, diversity in global talent pools is something that people are drawing attention to or the lack of diversity um, because of the, the, the racial justice conversations we've been having, uh, the fact that our solution brings greater diversity into those talent pools is something that we are, we are hopeful about. So we, we, st we are in a space where we see, we see a lot of possibility uh, going forward, a greater embracing of what we're putting on the table and an, and an agreement that you know, it's, not, it's not frivolous um, to have, um, you know, smart African problem solvers. It's actually good for Africa. It's good for the world. So that's where we, uh, that, that's, that's what we're excited about, Grant. Well, thank you so much, Lydia. That was an amazing conversation. Thanks so much for, for taking the time. Uh, best of luck, obviously, the rest of this year and the future. And I, I just think that it, it's, uh, I'm so optimistic about like Africa because I, I talked to so many people like just this past month. I've talked to like so many people like working on, on like just innovation and in, in Africa and, and it, this sort of youth movement there are like so inspiring of the potential for the continent, right? And you drew, drew some statistics out and I just think that, I think that Africa has a huge chance to kind of be, you know, a hub for a lot of innovation and solution and problem solving, you know, in the next couple of decades that I, I don't think we quite see coming yet, but it's a, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's coming. And I think uh, what you're doing is amazing. And please keep up the amazing work. Thank you for taking the time.